All right, it is 3.30. We're going to get going. Uh, this is the lightning talks. It may be quick. We only have one person at the moment uh, ready to go, but perhaps by the time she is done, we will have more. Uh, I do want to thank our sponsors. Those are the Evergreen Community Development Initiative and Mobius. They are sponsoring the conference, and it is welcome, as well as our advocate and other sponsors. Everybody's money is welcome, but especially those that pay the most. So first up is Andrea. Andrea is going to discuss troubleshooting tips for Hop-In. Andrea, take it. Yes, I'm already, I'm also laughing loud at um, your, everyone's money is welcome. <clears throat> right, so greetings, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for being here with us today. And uh, I want to just take a moment to say that we're very sorry for the issues that some of you have been experiencing with Hopin. Um, Rogan has been firing uh, support tickets at them like all day in between moderating sessions and giving sessions and all of that. So we're trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, there was an email sent out to everyone's registered email addresses a couple hours ago that y'all should have gotten um, with some troubleshooting tips on it. So if you're having issues, um, we, that link includes uh, static, like direct links into all of the sessions uh, because there's a um, there was a problem with the sessions displaying correctly. Uh, in reception. So this, those static links will take you directly into either track one or track two, um, as well as the separate sessions for interest groups, and then this one for lightning talks. Um, if you're experiencing audio and video issues, um, remember all of your browser troubleshooting tips. Uh, so, you know, refresh, hard refresh, um, try a different browser. Officially, uh, Hopin supports Chrome and Firefox, but there has been at least one person who said that they have had success on Edge um, where they were having trouble with Chrome. So try another browser. Um, make sure that you, if you have any uh, particular extensions that might be blocking certain traffic, uh, you might want to disable those extensions or try using incognito or a private browser mode. Um, I think that is all of the troubleshooting issues at f that, that come to mind. Um, but like I said, behind the scenes, um, we have been working furiously to try to get these addressed. And many thanks to our uh, presenters and uh, mods for rolling, rolling with everything. And of course, most of the sessions are being captioned. And so if you're having audio issues, take advantage of that lovely live captioning for by being sponsored by Mobius and um, you know, click on those caption links. So any... Um, any questions? Checking. So we got another another vote for Edge. Two votes for Edge. Three votes for Edge. Oh my gosh. All right. This is a very weird moment, you guys, where Edge is the solution to our problems. <laughs> and I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, I will say that I know several people who told me that they had plugins that they found out were causing mm -hmm. problems. And that seems to be why incognito mode works for some people. So especially, and this is ironic considering that We've had a lot of discussions about privacy at the conference, but privacy plugins to improve privacy seem to be interfering with Hopin. I know the irony. Um, I, I, I'm very, very sad about that, um, especially because I think Becky is literally in here in the lightning talks with us. We're sorry, Becky. Um, yes, the true privacy paradox. Anyway, um, I'm glad that it has only apparently been a few people um, and not everybody. It happened. Uh, to me as well, and resulted in myself and two presenters getting booted from a session. Fortunately, we were all able to get back in, and Jennifer and Kate rolled with that interruption beautifully. Um, so anyway, please uh, continue to let the organizers know if you experience issues, um, and we'll continue to work behind the scenes to try to get them resolved. And thank you for your patience. Uh, we use this platform with a good deal of success for Hackaway, but we're seeing that there are some quirks to a large scale scheduled event that we did not anticipate um, that are maybe making us reconsider this for a future large platform uh, choice. So um, any, uh, any, if anyone has any quick questions, you want to drop them in the chat, I'll try my best to answer them. Otherwise, I will um, yield the floor to somebody to talk about lightning. Or yes, Taryn, not allowing anyone in is one way to approach privacy. That is very true. So all right, 
Thanks, y'all. Thanks for hanging with us. Sorry for the troubles. All right. Who else wants to talk? Does anybody want to talk about discovery layers? Well, I will say, rather than sit here in silence, I'll ask you, Nan, did you have any particular questions about discovery layers in particular? So I have something to say about discovery layers real quickly. Um, we are not using one in Evergreen, Indiana, but we are looking uh, at um, a pretty big project that is going to make it very pertinent to us. King County is using Biblio Commons. Uh, the one that we are going to be looking at is Aspen. Um, I mean, we look at all of them, but this is in a particular context. And so we're very interested to hear uh, about uh, the experiences that others have um, had with this. The other thing is um, from a migration standpoint, th this is in the context of possibility of probability migrating a system who is going to actually use a discovery layer as a way to ease their patron experience. So they're going to um, start using the discovery layer prior to migrating to Evergreen so that their current ILS is plugged into that. And then when they do migrate to Evergreen, we'll see how this is gonna go, their patron experience won't change as much because it will be more behind the scenes. So a uh, discovery layer, is, and somebody is gonna need to correct me on this. Um, is is something it aggregates different catalogs and services so that people can uh, have one entry point into those resources <laughs> for libraries. That's a huge oversimplification of that. But and, and the term discovery layer is used slightly differently by different people. Some people very take it so. very literally and say, "Hey, here's the." Uh, layer that aggregates all of our different stuff together and provides the one universal search for others they treat it as kind of an opac replacement so mm -hmm. people can check holds and certs and stuff like that so there, there's a lot of variation and feature sets among different things that all call themselves discovery layers and i think that it was nan that i was actually talked to and i have to go back sorry if it was nan and i'm not really um, it wasn't, it was, it was Jennifer from Pales uh, when we were talking about how discovery layer and federated searches may be the same thing, may not be the same thing, depending as Rogan says on um, who's talking about what. So that's all I have to say. That's not really like anything informational other than to say i think it's a continuing conversation something that's going to grow more jason says sounds like a big pile of nope two big changes just one you can see i mean what do we yeah. have to say around here <laughs> yeah jane you can certainly show your discovery layer um, yeah i'm gonna so pop I off here so that somebody else can do that yeah uh, I will say there are a lot of discovery layers out there. Some are commercial, some are open source. Uh, there are quite a few that I've seen used with Evergreen. And as Jason indicated, you know, doing another discovery layer is not necessarily as easy as just plugging Lego blocks together. Especially if you're putting in patron transactions as part of it. All right, I'm going to pass it to Jane. All right, I'll show you our discovery layer, which is like an in-house one that's built on an open source piece of software called Blacklight. Um, I always like blank on which is the screen sharing button. It's the one that looks like a monitor. Oh, that does make I sense. Always, <laughs> I always want it to be the, U I kept clicking the YouTube icon personally. So here it is. It's called Find It. Um, that logo, one of our students made that. 
Um, it's got uh, autocomplete. When you start searching, um, it brings in data from a bunch of different sources. So like the books and videos section comes a lot from Evergreen, just like regular mark dumps. Um, and then also we get a lot of information about like our eBooks and streaming video subscriptions from OCLC. And then the top part with the uh, news articles and journal articles, it's coming from EBSCO Discovery Service. They have an API and we just grab data from that API. Um, if you click into books and videos, we've got like um, just some availability information about if you can grab it from other libraries in our consortium or from our own collection. We've got this fun little facet where you can like drag around the years to figure out what years you want. Um, and then once you do actually like click request pick or request curbside pickup, that does just like bring you to your Evergreen account. Um, we didn't try to like re-implement the account page or anything like that. It really is just like for searching and getting that bibliographic data. Oh, and you can do citations in it, which is pretty nice. And it, we have citations in all the different formats that are used on campus. So that's our discovery layer. Um, Jane, you have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, Taryn um, asked, how often do you have to upload the bib records? Um, Taryn, it's kind of like whenever we feel like it, <laughs> honestly. It's something we're, I think it's something that we need to get like more systematic and regular, but every week or two usually. Oh, and Sharon, it's um, one we built in-house, but it's based on software called Blacklight, which is just like a general search interface um, software. I can drop the link in the chat once I find it. I think that there are maybe some libraries still using Viewfind. Maybe. Oh, Jeremy, we did it at the same time. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people talking about Viewfind lately. Yeah, Viewfind is still definitely supported. Yeah, Viewfind, there's there's more adoption in the COA world with Viewfind, but there are a handful of evergreen libraries also using Viewfind. Um, Frank, personally, I'd love to see more you know, development of, in any of the open source directions for uh, discovery layers. It seems like a good good way to go. And I will say, Viewfind is open source, but I know of quite a few uh, libraries that use commercial ILSs that use Viewfind as well. So. Isn't that what Dan Scott was using at Laurentian? Was it Viewfind? I don't know, but that seems very possible. Hmm. Not that it matters back in the day. Does Laurentian still have a library? They have a library, but it's not an evergreen library. <laughs> well, they, they've had serious financial problems. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, the unit that your Laurentian University has had a tough six months. Mm -hmm. Can anyone do an Aspen demo? I can't. <laughs> I can't either. Uh, although this, all of this is making me think we should have scheduled around, you know, a session for uh, discovery layers. It may be well next year for the conference. It's a good idea. Aaron, are you saying that you can do a demo for Aspen? Is that what, is that what's happening here? Aspen demo. Uh, yes. And I believe that the, well, never mind. I'm, I'm speaking out of turn in a thing that's going through my mind. So. Right. 
remember anyone if you want to um talk uh talk to the people uh the request use the button at the upper right of the screen to share audio and video and either rogan and i or i will give you permission asked with discovery layers are um, I'm going to steal roots definition, which is effectively um, it's a it's a way to search across several different kinds of uh, resources. So you can search your catalog, you can search your journals, um, you can search other other content. It's sort of like a lot of them incorporate like a federated search element to them, but it also sort of puts like a friendly skin on top of stuff. Um, some of them can incorporate like social elements or sharing elements. Um, it depends a lot on the discovery layer, but the very short version is it's a skin on top of your OPAC that lets it do extra things. So. Anybody else? Ah, uh, yeah, Becky, go for it. All right, so there we go. All right, so uh, I'm going to keep camera off for now. But for folks who can hear me, I can do a quick overview of uh, de-identification methods. I know I mentioned de-identification in my keynote talk. Some of you might be wondering what exactly that is. Um, is there a way I can share my screen? All right, so I'm gonna give you a quick overview first off over what data that I'm talking about when I talk about de-identification methods. Um, Y'all might, some of you might all be familiar with the definition of personally identifiable information. I am using the National Institute of Standards and Technologies definition of it, which splits it into two types of data. Um, data about a person, which is name, address, your phone number, library barcode. And the second category is activity that can be tied back to a patron. Um, your circulation history, your Wi-Fi sessions, your reference questions, program attendance, IP address, and so on. So you might be wondering where these slides are coming from. They are available. This is just a tangent. They are available on this site. I've been working with uh, PLP for a couple years about data privacy practices. So you can look at that site to look a little bit more into those slides. So let me go ahead and get to... All right, so de-identification methods. So they're designed... This slide is actually pretty small. You can get to this through the Future of Privacy Forum. So if you do a quick search of Future of Privacy Forum, you will be able to find and add the term de-identification. You can find this slide. Um, so de-identification methods are designed to protect individual privacy while preserving some of the data set's utility for other purposes. So you'll find that the middle two categories, the pseudonymous data and de-identified data, are the ones that you'll probably be encountering if you want to de-identify data. I do want to make the distinction between anonymization and de-identification because sometimes we use those terms interchangeably, but they're not the same. Anonymization commonly refers to the tools and methods that break specific data points from any individual. So this approach decreases, or in some cases eliminates the risk of re-identification, but current research says that's 
extremely difficult to have a truly anonymized data set. So de-identification is that one step removed where PII is eliminated or transformed to break a link between the real person, real world person and the data, while still preserving some ability to do research on the data. There are a few ways you can do de-identification. The first one is obfuscation, where you take your data and create that fuzzy border by moving the reference point of the data up a few levels of granularity. And for here, I use birth date as an example. So if you know a person's full birth date, you can identify an individual and you can steal their identity. However, if we use age, we remove the day and month from the data set, but we still have enough data to report on age-related statistics. A lot of people share the same birth year, so it's harder to pinpoint a person if we just have the age instead of the full date of birth. Truncation is just basically taking the raw data and using a small subsection. Again, subsection of data has to be general enough that you don't easily connect that data snippet with a real-world person. Uh, with data about a person, we can take that full address and snip it down to zip code. Now, if you are familiar with HIPAA, which is a regulation, US regulation that deals with health data, um, they go even further and they stripped the last, they stripped the last two zip, co zip code digits. So you only have the first three. Um, for PII2 data, data about a person's activity, um, call numbers are really tricky. You can truncate them, but they're not only location markers, but they're also subject markers. So you have to take care as to how you approach truncating PII2 data or data about a person's activity. It gets tricky because there's enough lingering information in there where you can re-identify a person. And aggregation is just basically taking obfuscation or truncation and bringing up a yet a more um, higher level but you trade off in granularity of reporting. So let's take our age and we put them into age ranges. Or for activities of a person, we can group call numbers together. So how would this, and there's a couple other de-identification methods that you can use, but I'll just skip over those for now. Um, just to give you a example of what these look like. You have date of birth, you have the address, you have call numbers, and a timestamp. Now, these are just one way. Um, there's no one right way to de-identify data, but you can, you, you can approach it this way in terms of just using the age. Now we can use the, we can use the year, for example, we could put it in a age bracket for de-identifying the date of birth. We took the zip code, we can truncate that zip code even further. Uh, we took the first order of the call number, first and second order of the call number, that might be a little bit too identifying, so it might be NX, might be more appropriate. Um, fiction, fiction's really hard to de-identify. Uh, de we did our best here, we just noted that it's a fiction book. And we just de-identified the timestamp to the day and the length of the session. Again, de-identification does has its limitations. You have outliers and service populations and small service populations, which can make de-identification not viable. So this is the disclaimer that you need to do research and tests just to make sure that your de-identification methods are not going to lead for re-identification, particularly for data that is published or reported out to external audiences. All right, I'm gonna quit sharing here. Anyone, any questions? Well, it doesn't look like any questions, but a lot of thanks. And thank you for that, Becky. That was interesting. Um, no problem. Thank you. I unfortunately have hit the limit of time, so I have to jump over to another session I'm moderating. 
the folks are welcome to hang out and chat. And we're going to have more lightning talks tomorrow. So if anybody was feeling too nervous today, but there's something you want to talk about, make sure to come tomorrow and share it with us. All right. Everybody have a good conference.